Sometimes you can be a great solution to a problem that they didn't realize they had. And, and we build our firm on that simple, basic concept. Hello, and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I had the great pleasure of speaking to Walter Marin, who is the founder and senior principal of Walter Marin Architects. So Walter set up the firm over 30 years ago, and they've developed a very diverse portfolio of work, working in residential, multi-unit residential, retail, healthcare, institutional work, and as well as you know, working with a number of New York developers on very prominent buildings in the city. And they've obviously weathered numerous recessions and in this episode Walter goes into a lot of detail of some of the strategies for weathering recessions how they've been able to prosper over the long term and over the last 30 um, plus years and he talks a lot about this idea of actually much of the practice was as he describes built out of ignorance but Actually, when we go under the, the surface there, we start to recognize a lot of very astute entrepreneurial thinking and relationship building that was providing a foundation for a very successful business. So Walter outlines um, some of our misconceptions around working with developers and how we often assume that they've got everything together and they know exactly what it is that they're doing. And Walter describes that actually this is not always the case. And as architects, when we're able to identify where there are some problems and challenges that developers are facing, this is often a fantastic point for us to be able to create and deliver services. He also talks about collecting intelligence as a way of growing the practice, visiting conferences and researching and identifying trends in different sectors and industries. So being able to look forward into the future and anticipate what kinds of challenges various sectors are going to be able to have and developing services around those kinds of challenges. So this was a fascinating interview um, that really outlines and details how Walter has developed and grown the business. So sit back, relax and enjoy Walter Marin. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Walter, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm fine. Excellent. So you are the founder and principal of Marin Architects in New York. Um, you've had a really exciting career. You've been at the helm of the business for uh, how long exactly have you been? Have you did you, I'm going to say you, just about 35 years, although I'm not willing to admit to that too often. Uh, <laughs> <but> yes. <laughs> and you, the, the, the business is, has, has gone, you know, you've weathered a number of uh, economic recessions. You've got multiple sectors that you're, that you're working in. Um, and you've got a, quite a diverse portfolio of, of extraordinary work around the New York and area and, and beyond. Um, I think to, to get started with the conversation, you know, how did you begin? How did the company start? You know, the, the interesting part of it is, um, I'm going to say part of it is pure ignorance, uh, the way you start. But, um, and I also believe that, you know, most architectural students go through, you know, the four or five years of education, um, have this sort of fantasy world that you'll be the next Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm -hmm. um, then you face the reality of what an office environment looks like, and obviously that, that's far from it. Um, somehow in my DNA, uh, I was always meant to go on my own, although it didn't quite start out that way um, yeah. when I was in college. Um, I did take on a couple of jobs, so I wound up working uh, a significant number of hours for an architecture firm, which really gave me a, a nice background across the board. Um, so by the time I was graduated, uh, I had a significant uh, amount of work behind me, and mm -hmm. so I got hired by a, a small firm uh, 
um, Howard Golden Associates. I'm not sure if they're around anymore. Um, and, and basically, I worked for them for about two years. Um, I met a gentleman uh, in that process who was a GC, um, offered me a partnership, which I thought was a you know, cool idea. Um, and so I uh, started to work with him. Six months into it, I realized that that relationship wasn't going to go uh, you know, where I'd like to go. And I just wasn't comfortable with the nature of the way he practiced. And uh, so we were on a building on 23rd Street. It actually happens to be the Masons building. And, and what's cool about the, the building itself is that um, it's got, it's, it's pretty much a, 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 an office building that's maintained to probably the 20s. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's got what I refer to as the old fashioned detective stories hallway, where you come down the hallway and all the windows, all the offices have glass with the name on it. <laughs> uh, and so this was very cool. So, so we were in that building. So I, I got to be very friendly with the, the owner's uh, representative. Um, and so he, he, he gave me an office space. And so, so I moved in there and, and basically started practice. But the interesting part of it is I rented this big space and I sublet half of it. Um, right. And when I did the transaction, the, the other half, they couldn't figure out, they couldn't get rent. I didn't know any better. So I rented it to them. And, and the beauty was that they started to pay rent day one. And I didn't have to pay rent for the first three months. So, you know, I had enough income to be able to <laughs> keep myself afloat for the first three months. Um, and shortly thereafter, um, the GC who had brought me in to deal with an account, which at the time was called Akajo, which would be what with Banana Republic is today. And mm-hmm. so we started to do work for them. They paid me a commission for $3,500 to do a job and never called me up to do the job. Um, so so a combination, a little bit of rent that I got from my neighbor and, and and, and that $3,500 kind of kept us alive for a number of months. Um, and and to, for the life of me, I will tell you, I have no clue how I got my first real job or how we really got. So to me, that's sort of a big giant blank. Um, the only thing is that obviously if you accelerated that about three or four years, um, I was making enough money to pay my rent, which at the time wasn't very much. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, transportation back and forth to the office. Um, and and it, from there, it's just, you know, it grew from a three-man firm to a 10-man firm mm-hmm. um, and sort of evolved. Uh, from that office, we moved across the street uh, to a nice sort of kind of uh, six-story building. We took our own floor. It gave us a little bit more um, exposure. And then from there, we moved in our current offices, which is, in, is, is on 38th Street, um, and it's a 5,000 square foot. Now, the difference is one of my consultants said to me is, whatever you do, don't rent, buy. And so we, we bought the floor. So we've been here a good, uh, almost 18 years now. Um, right. And so it's, and then from here is really where we took the largest growth. Um, and the good thing is I, I don't have a landlord to deal with, but I do mm-hmm. have a bank to deal with. And sometimes I think the banks are probably more tougher than the landlords. Uh, <laughs> but for some reason over the years, we, we seem to have uh, grown. And, and our, most of our growth has been uh, developed over, I'm going to say, goodwill uh, aspect of it building a good brand, having good relationship with our clients. Um, I think that in the history of the firm, we've only been fired once on the job. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that particular reason is was um, I was fired because I, had, um, I did not have a license at the time. And the, and, the, and the owner didn't realize that, and he felt very uncomfortable, and that's the reason we did. Sure. Obviously, shortly thereafter, obviously, we did become licensed and obviously ran the appropriate practice. Um, but but it, it really started out out of, um, you know, the, the difference between starting a business where you have no responsibility other than yourself. Mm-hmm. It's significantly easy to take a challenge that when you have established family where you really have to worry about the rent, the wife, the kids, you know, and everything that sort of fits into that aspect of it. So, so would, you, would you say in the early days you had, a, you had a kind of healthy appetite for risk and, you know, you weren't, you didn't necessarily have all those other responsibilities that allowed you to... Yeah, so, so I, I put all that in the quotation called ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> One, I did not know enough to know that I shouldn't be doing it. So, <laughs> so there is an interesting part to that. Uh, but, but I will also tell you the, the interesting part is somewhere in the early days, I said, oh, maybe, maybe I did this wrong and maybe I, I should not even, uh, you know, I should just give up and go get a job. Now, the, <laughs> the interesting part of doing all of this was the one thing I had was an education. I had the background. I had enough so that if I failed uh, the next morning after my failure, I just go get a job and I worked for somebody, uh, which did occur about three or four years into it. 
Um, and I said, oh, my God, maybe it's, I did the wrong thing. So I went out and started the interview. And so um, I'm going to say it's probably in, in the early 80s, um, someone offered me a job paying me $75,000. Now, $75,000 is, is a significant, you know, in the 80s, so we're looking almost 40 years ago. Well, I mean, yeah. My math is a little wrong, but in, it was in the 90s. So in the 90s, I went to, to look for a job and in early 90s, and somebody had offered me this uh, this thirty seventy five thousand, and I went home and I said, "Oh my God, you're you're, you're a freaking idiot!" I said, "He's a total stranger, has more faith in you, and is giving you seventy five grand to to do it, and you don't have enough on your own." And so I never took the job. <laughs> so I decided that I should have more faith in myself, and and obviously that's sort of the way the the practice went along. And and what kind of work did you? initially start doing have you did you so, you didn't go down the route of doing a lot of residential work and i guess in new york it's it's quite different and you're so, going to no, be it, doing yeah yeah it's interesting because um uh, i don't remember how i wound up with a, i had a friend who's in the laundry business and they needed architects to file laundry mats and, and so the cool thing about it i guess this is and this was all pre-computer stuff so we used to draw a layout of equipment right and it was a pretty standard equipment so we would xerox this paste onto a clear film, which we then stick onto a drawing. And so so the initial drawing started out as, you know, what we would do today, where you're copying CAD drawing from one to another. There we were doing it paste on onto a sheet. Um, yeah. And so uh, my initial work literal had literal copy paste. Literally <laughs> cut and paste. Uh, yeah. And because it was laundry mats, it became really easy. So so we started to do laundry mats. And I learned very quickly about multiples. Um, so, you know, we, we, the first year we, you know, done a couple of dozen laundromats, the fees were decent. Um, and, and so it, it kind of evolved and then it put me in a format of trying to figure out how to find duplicates. Um, meaning, you know, what, what kind of client can I get that allows me to do duplicates? And therefore we, we wind up doing a lot more retail work. And when we started, we started to really build retail because most retailers would hire you to do multiple stores. So, you know, we went after, you know, and this obviously all of it came out for the original uh, Akajo, which basically was a clothing store, and there was a duplication. And then we got into the drugstore industry. And, and the interesting part of the drugstore industry um, is, is really where my early philosophy of trying to figure out the trends of what's happening out. And so walking through the street, the one thing that became obvious uh, was that drugstores were coming in, um, into place. And one of the thoughts that went through my head initially was, Okay, there's a lot of drugstores being built, right? So why would they just hire this architect? You know, if you're building that many stores, you, you got to have your stuff together, right? And so the first initial thought would be, why even bother? So um, I did a little research. I found out who was the head of construction, or in this case, Rite Aid. And I literally called this guy, you know, I, I don't want to say that I called him every day, but I definitely called him every other day. I called him so often enough that... Um, I realized I was going to do one or two things was going to happen. I was going to get a phone call or I was going to get a piece of paper with a restraining order like the bottom <laughs> or they were going to come see me and give me a job. So it turns out that this young man uh, at the time, Barry Chris, um, head of construction for Rite Aid, got in his car one morning, drove from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to my office. Now, obviously, he set up an appointment and he was curious who this guy was that was pesting him so much. Um, and so he was determined to tell me, you know, don't call me again, or he was going to give me a job. But the curiosity was greater because he figured if this guy's this persistent, maybe we should give him an opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did. He came, gave us a job, and I, to this day, we probably have built 250 stores. And that, wow. was really, that was really the benchmark of what brought the firm alive. So we went from this 5,000-square-foot store to a 10,000, to a 12,000, 15,000-foot store for mm -hmm. Um, and then we got into situations where the result of Rite Aid, we met a lot of landlords. So the Rite Aid went into a bigger mall, to then to a second story, to a multi-story building. Um, but historically, for an, almost almost a, two decades, we built drugstores with other things around it, uh, only because landlords liked the idea that the architect could handle the whole thing, and, and with us came the drugstore. Um, mm -hmm. And so it wound up being a, a mutual benefit to both us and, and the client. And I'll say to this day, because of our strong retail background, um, that a lot of landlords hire us to do the building, knowing that we can help at no commission bring a tenant into the space 
Uh, yeah. So it almost, our clients kind of say, okay, Walter will pay for his commission, what we pay him, simply from the savings that we won't have to pay a real estate agent uh, because of the tendency or the power of some of the of our clientele that, that sort of follows along with us. Uh, and we so, 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 so it's really interesting that you've, you, sounds like you've always been very proactive in the way that you've gone after work and quite thoughtful in, in actually identifying certain sectors or certain types of clients that you'd be able to help and then, and then, and then make those relationships. Yeah. So, so I, I, I have this, this constant joke that I make that I was in the wrong business. I should have been in mergers and acquisitions. Um, <laughs> And, 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 to the, and to this day, I will tell you that uh, my single biggest job is introducing two people to each other. Um, mm. and, and, and sometimes I get a job directly, but most of the time, I'm almost guaranteed a job indirectly. Um, and I find that relationship really works. Um, but the catch to all of that is to try to figure out what that trend is. And, and that's something I, I focus a lot of attention on. Um, and so I could tell you I predicted the coffee. I predicted the drugstore. The drugstore is something that's more... But on us, I predicted the gyms, you know, that whole mm-hmm. trend with the gyms. Um, and obviously, fast food uh, has gone through over the last 30 years to about three or four curves. Right now, it's up on the high side. Um, yep. you know, food has is, is become um, – America has discovered that we can buy food in the corner. Um, and and, and so, are the, so are the providers of, of the food realize it's a huge market. Um, and I think COVID, obviously, I think contributed to some of that. Uh, but historically, I've gone through um, – uh, a method of trying to figure out where trends are. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so I'll give you uh, a great example um, currently, and I'll give you what I consider the current aspect of it. So every, nobody wants to come to the office. And it's, and it's a, um, I'm going to say there, there are two sides to that fence. Um, uh, obviously, employees want to stay home. Employers don't want them to stay home. Okay. Um, and, and so um, you, you think, you know, where, where are you headed with all of this? Meaning, where's tomorrow's office space? New York City, I think, only has about 40, 45% occupancy. 55 is unoccupied. So, um, but one of the things that we found out recently is between Amazon and Google uh, committed to themselves to about 2 million, do- 2 million square feet of office space. So if you think you're going remote, especially these big giants, why would you want to bring all of this? Why would you commit to that kind of square footage in New York City? So we think that there is a trend that's sort of happening there. Um, now, and then, and then there's a number of buildings that have been put up in New York that are like one Vanderbilt, which is the, the, the biggest one, uh, where if you go into there, half the building is a living room space. Um, the other, I'm exaggerating, I quite half, but a significant part of the building has a living room space. Because now, now employees need to compete with the living room in their house. So by providing mm-hmm. a social event where it becomes part of daily life, uh, you trend. So I got to believe that some of the big people are saying, okay, we, 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 we're not going to win too much on, 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 on remote work, However, we can't uh, bring them back into the office space and give them something that's somewhat equal. Um, and then you sort of benefit. So I get to be in my living room, but at the same time, I'm going to be, you're going to remotely work from work. <laughs> it's probably the best way of describing it. Uh, so we're going to give you what life is at home, except with all of your buddies versus being at home alone. Um, so I think there is a trend to that. And so the firm is, is, has started to look at you know, various types of buildings that don't quite have that. Or seeking mm-hmm. landlords. Um, now, it may be a trend; they may not. Uh, but I think that there's there's some shifting. So that's a good example of where we need to look at work. Um, and so, whether we're, bu- we're building a new building or whether we're doing a major renovation to a building, I think some of that thinking starts to occur. Right. Um, and so, this is just looking at what's happening in the street. That's the best way. So we build this firm by walking the streets. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the kind of buildings going up, how many residential. So there are trends and based on my initial lesson, is people who are developing these things don't have it together as much as most people think they do. Uh, and yeah. sometimes you can be a great solution to a problem that they didn't realize they had. Um, and, and we built our firm on that simple basic concept. Um, and, and so when I can tell you how we manage to, to build work, it comes purely out of that. Um, I think the other way that a lot of people do happens to do with um, I'm going to say a, a, no, a no boys network kind of concept. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and we make a joke that today we're the old boys. Um, um, but but when you start out as a young firm, um, it's either you try to figure out how to build business from nothing, or you try to build business from a relationship that may come from a generation in the past. Um, yeah. So I was fortunate not to have that. 
<laughs> uh, and so I was much more creative about trying to figure out how to find clientele. Amazing. So, so w when you're identifying trends, how does that, is there a formula that you have to it or is this much more something, you know, are you in a, a kind of state of absorption, if you like, where you're, you've just got well, a natural so, so, interest in other industries or? So the interesting part is, um, so there are a number of different real estate shows that happen um, uh, throughout the country and, 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 and I actually they have one also big in New York. So we attend those kind of shows. So, right. uh, so specifically, they're really the industry, um, and, and, and like I said, there's a number of different trade shows where you have landlords trying to rent their space, and you have tenants looking for space. Um, and so um, that's kind of how we predicted, the, I'm going to call it for a moment, um, the gym world, what the gym has, is because we went to these convention shows, and there were three or four different gyms um, there trying to uh, entice landlord to giving them space. Um, and, and so uh, that simple trend. Um, and so what we do is we go there, uh, we introduce ourselves to the um, and, and like convention show. Everybody wants to talk to everybody. Um, so, so we go, we introduce ourselves, we find out who's head of construction um, and then go back, you know, grab the five, six names and then blitz them, uh, call them up, you know. And, and, and obviously um, they vary from situation to situation. Some are a little bit open, some are not. But we've been able enough to be able to get one or two out of maybe mm -hmm. five or six clientele that we come along. Um, and most of the guys says, oh, my God, it's amazing you called us because we're doing this, right? And it's only because of the intelligence that we got of what their corporate site was doing for us to then be able to do that. Um, you know, and, and I will tell you, anyone from, from although Starbucks, I don't think we've ever really done anything for them, but, but from the Starbucks to the Joe's Coffees to, to uh, all of the various things. Um, and that also applies to the development side of things. Um, you know, what developers has shown up to a show and what are they trying to sell? And then so aggressively, we sort of go after that sort of thing. Um, and then, but the, the biggest one I think that is obvious is walking the city, mm -hmm. you know, and, and being obvious to, to what's around you. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's probably been the single biggest tool, um, you know, only because it, sometimes it, it's so obvious and so stupidly um, easy notifiable, but, but most people just kind of roots around it. Um, and giving you the simple example of, you know, why does Amazon and, and, and Google commit to a couple of million square feet of office space? I mean, they're not doing it because they're going to send everybody remote. Um, yeah. And so, so that's, that's the kind of indicator that there's some serious difference in trend that's going to happen to that office space. Um, and so in order to do all that stuff, you, you're going to need an architect. So, so, um, so at the end of the day, that's, that's a, a, a good way of, of being able to sort of find an indicator. Um, now, but the other part that, that's sort of important to all of this is um, there's, there's a young lady who, who's head of our marketing department today, um, and, and we hired her a little bit under a year ago. And she comes from a firm, which I, I thought was hilarious. It was a three-man firm, and she was one of three, okay? And, and I said, boy, I thought this guy was a genius because he thought about, you know, Let's get marketing to help us get business. It's a great idea. However, she did an okay job based on her standards, but the work she brought in, the firm couldn't support. Uh, <laughs> so, so she lost the job very quickly because she realized that in a very quick way, she outperformed us. Uh, so working for a firm obviously became a whole different size because we're significantly larger than a three-man firm. But yeah. that's the yeah. other secret. You, you got to be ready. Uh, because you can create a door, you can create an opportunity, you can wind up getting this great clientele, but if you cannot support that clientele, it's as good as not having it. Uh, right. Uh, and then the expectation, especially when you're a new firm coming into any organization, is significantly high. And, and, and so, so that plays a, a huge role. So, so you almost have to size what you want to go after against what you can actually support. Um, and, and, and sometimes that doesn't sort of occur. And then obviously along with that is understanding what the client wants to do versus what your ego as an architect wants to do. And, and then we yeah. sort of have to sort of well, balance those two out. How, how do you balance that? Like the, the you know, knowing what, the, what you can currently support versus what you're going after. And also how does that work in terms of, well, we want to go for bigger projects, but we don't have the team first. So you've got the kind of chicken and egg scenario so, do we so win the, the work first then bring people in or how, how do you mitigate and, and 
deal so with the, that tension. The, the interesting part of that statement was when I was in, I'm going to say the early 30s at the very beginning of the firm, someone says, look, Walter, no one's going to seriously take you serious until you're at least in your mid-40s, right? So here I am in my early 30s with this brand new baby firm and hearing that statement, that's not what I want to hear. Um, so I simply <laughs> said, okay, that may be a true statement. I'm going to accept that to be a true statement. That means I have about 15 years to practice to get to that point. Um, and so I took that attitude across the board. Um, and and um, I'm sorry. So, so your question is, is, is uh, yeah. How, how do how do you how do you balance that tension between going after big work and then not necessarily having the team to to deliver it? So, so the uh, which the which day, comes first? Do you win the work and then build the team, or do you build the team and then win the work? It, it it really is a combination of both. Because ultimately, when you get interviewed for a project of any significance, you got to be able to. The, the client is going to want to see what your support team looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a balance. So it's almost like you have to itch yourself up um, or you can start out as, as doing what we refer to as the design side of the projects and then turn it over to another firm that does the, the development of the documents. Um, and then you eventually sort of become both of those. Um, ah. uh, and, and historically, that's how most firms of a design level tend to perform. Um, and so what happens is some firms choose to be on the design side heavily, mm -hmm. and there's some firms who are heavily on to the development side. The development side is developing the construction documents of the design firm. Um, and, and some firms sort of run parallel. So there is a separation between the two. Um, there are some major firms that have grown up on the development side of it and not on the design side of it. Um, and, and those two kind of become a quick separation. Uh, now, design firms are one out of every 10 and there's literally, you know, nine firms that do the other half. So the design side of it is limited uh, proportionally to the whole process. The design side of it can be short. Uh, and then yeah. there's some firms that make more money as a design firm than they do as a uh, construction document or, or the production side of it. Um, um, but, but, but at the end of the day, it's, it's sort of how the industry sort of learns to balance itself out. So those that's very interesting so some projects you would have been kind of positioning yourself as being able to be the concept the ideas yeah. people the early stage work and then you would collaborate with another architect right. so um, when to, you look at when you look at the big brands and, and the, you know the rats of pianos of the world um, yeah the firms the the owners cannot afford for them to do the entire project yes um, unless it's some serious uh, product that you're trying to sell at the opposite end mm -hmm. um and so what they do is they'll join two architectural firms, um, and it winds up being a significant cost savings to, to the client. Um, and it's rare when, when it's purely one heavy design firm, or, you know, let's call it one of the five or ten in the world. Um, but those are then driven by, by significantly larger budgets, and, and, and they're aware of, of, of the cost of that. But means that the output, meaning the end product that is producing, will produce enough revenue to be able to support a significantly high fee. Uh, but there's always a balance between the two. Uh, you know, as, as most developers have a lot of expenses, so they try to shave as much as they possibly can across mm -hmm. the board. Um, and they're being smart about it uh, because there are very, very competent firms that can do um, what we refer to the architect of record work versus the design side of, 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 uh, of the industry. Uh, so we happen to fall somewhere in the middle. Um, right. So we do have a certain amount of design work, um, and we also have a, a certain amount of uh, architectural record work. Now, I'll give you a good example of an architectural work. So we, ha we have a number of small accounts that we, we maintain, um, going back to our early days. So, so right now, Pizza Hut happens to be one of our accounts, um, mm -hmm. and, and we're doing an average of 30 to 40 sites a year. Um, right. But they give us the design. We just copy it, produce it, and be able to duplicate it. Um, and so yeah. that's more of what an architect of record would do. Um, yeah. Pizza Hut would hire one firm to design the Pizza Hut. We would then mm -hmm. get that and multiply it. Um, Got it. So, all right, so that's uh, sort of a quick. Uh, when you get into the significant larger projects, obviously that changes uh, a little bit more because it's, it's more the ones versus the multiples. Um, yes. But as a design firm, we have to get both because the multiples maintain cash flow. Um, the more prestigious firms run a lot longer um, fees are larger, but then it, it paces the firm. So the balance of those two kind of concepts is really what has kept this firm healthy over the years. Amazing. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, 
so you, you've obviously you've survived, thrived, gone through a number of recessions since the, uh, the since the beginning of the business. How have you weathered those kind of economic storms? And and is this strategy part and parcel of that success? Yeah, it, I, absolutely. I, so so um, in, in the nineteen late eighties, um, when we were doing the drugstores. Um, the drugstores for us in the one account, by the way, represented about 89% of our business. And right. One, one afternoon, I get a phone call, stop all work. Um, and uh, it was devastating, <laughs> uh, to say the least. And so we quickly realized, or I should say I quickly realized that, okay, I know what I do, how to do retail. I can never let this happen again. Go after more retail clients. And so I think over the, the following five to, to 10 years, we managed to build a very nice portfolio retail side of it. Um, mm -hmm. And then one afternoon, retail died. It wasn't one store, it was all of it. So retail has gone through these massive loops. Um, and so I realized, okay, I got to diversify now and go after other things that are not retail. Um, and then we managed to, based on both those philosophy, one is, Keep more than one client, keep more than one industry. So over the last 30 years, we've managed to do literally five different industries. Um, so hospitality, residential, non-for-profits, institutional work, and a little bit of government work. Um, and what we found over the years is that we can do any of those five sectors. None of them all come at the same time. Uh, right. Maybe two will come at the same time. So they all sort of have their own loops. Uh, but we, if we had to, if we had to take all the industries and graph them over the last twenty years relative to busyness, no two industries or no three industries fail at the same time, or or take the lower dip. Um, so what happens is th there are years. A good example: over the last five years, the amount of residential work we've done is historically high. Okay, mm -hmm. if you go five years before that, we did an enormous amount of institutional work. So stuff like we do stuff for Columbia University and a bunch of non for profits. And then prior to that, it was heavy retail, which at one time was, was up in the hemisphere. So if you chart it all along, what's kept the firm uh, healthy was to keep away from a single type clientele. Um, so, um, you know, like an office interiors started out at one point was a heavy part of our, of our industry. An office interiors has been in, a, in decline for literally almost two decades. Um, so we keep a track of all those, all those trades and, and stuff like that. Um, in the combination, obviously, walking the streets or going to these trade shows, um, it's, it allows us to try to at least understand where we are going to get busy. And then after that, we then try to identify what kind of clientele is doing that kind of work. Um, and then therefore, that's, that's sort of it. Now, how, how, how have you man maintained uh, a diverse portfolio like you have and then not be perceived as a generalist architect, but still maintain like expertise or being a specialist in each of those sectors? So, so the interesting part of, of um, so I'll give you a good example. Um, so our, we get hired heavily by the residential developers because of our retail background. So, so one of the problems is, is most residential architects don't understand the ground floor. And it, it's really a very simple concept. So the ground floor, uh, I make, I make a, a, a joke that doesn't, does not want to have any trees, basically columns, okay? Um, and so what happens is most residential developers will design the grid to the residential apartments based on the apartments. And so you right. end up with a forest on the first floor. And retail, you can't put shelves between, you know, you got to figure out how to, you know, the, the retail fits on a perfect grid. You got to put in shelves, you got to put in nice height, right? And so most architects are designing, the, you know, a typical floor and then dropping the columns. We do the reverse. We design the retail store and then figure out how that fits the apartment. And we make the apartments fit the ground floor. Mm -hmm. um, the value of a typical project in any development is that as much as 30% of the building's value is on the first floor. The other 70 fall on top of that. Um, and so, so developers who historically have done residential buildings like hiring us because we understand the ground floor. Um, and so this diversified actually has worked in our favor more than it has it. Because um, right. then we also can talk about the second floor, which is part of a institutional work or other aspects of it. So, so we've used the diversified 
as being more of a specialist in the ability to do them all. Um, and because of the global exposure across the board, um, it, it makes us for a much better firm to hire. Um, mm -hmm. Because today, today there are very few projects that say, okay, we're just this. Right. Now, where yeah. this doesn't apply, which is one that we don't have, we can't apply that philosophy to a hospital. Right. In a hospital, you got to be a hospital specialist. There, there's no, there's no like, you know, we're going to put something in the ground floor. But the rest of, I'm going to say, the real world, um, it, 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 it become more of a positive than it is a negative. Um, so, and maybe so, so museums. Museums is probably the other one that, that, that we haven't been very good at trying to get because uh, even though we've done uh, places that are, uh, I wouldn't call them the Guggenheims, but, but uh, some of our museum work, uh, goes off. but it is limited. But the guys who do museum, that's all they do. And there's a very few museums. And every single architect in the world, including all the young men who are graduating, all want to do a museum because it's an ability to demonstrate their signature as an architect. Yeah. Uh, so the competition there is significantly high. Uh, we've tried many times to try to get them, but we have not been as successful, simply because we don't have enough specialty on that actual day. Mm. So with with and I know you you've you've got quite a bit of work in in healthcare and um, with in with in that sector. How did you manage to start moving or applying your expertise in there? And how did you was that a, was that a proactive approach to following a similar sort of strategy where you're identifying a trend within certain so, elements so we of healthcare? To do, or? We started to do work for a non for profit small organization uh, who who needed to build some of the clinical spaces. Um, yeah. And, and the, the cool thing about being an architect, at least in my opinion, is 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 that, um, or, or at least the right way of doing it is, um, I've always approached any of my problems as, and this is the way I describe it to my client, I'm now your partner, I'm now an equal share, I have no clue about what your industry is, so now you need to educate. And so what we do is we try to educate ourselves on the nature of the way uh, the organization functions. Um, mm -hmm. And then from that, we then built um, a solution to their problem. Um, and so because obviously the creative side of us kicks in, you know, the colorfulness kicks in. And in between those two, we try to figure out the, the function and the operational side of things. Um, and I always say that if you can get the function of a facility to work perfectly, they're going to think you're the most greatest architect in the world. Um, versus trying to make a statement about the system and then trying to work into it. So you can have a gorgeous design that you can't work in, you know, it becomes quickly useless very quickly. Um, so part of that has allowed us to, to come into various different industries to try to fix problems. Like we, we helped create an assembly line on how to create cookies. Right. And so we were very creative in helping them figure out how to make it work so that one, so that it went from one place to another. Um, and, and it's the creative side of us that they, they, they teach, but at the same time, we kind of learn all this cool stuff about machines and, and things along. We also went through a very similar exercise doing, we used to work for young brands, although we're doing some stuff for them today, uh, where KFC was one of our stores. And the interesting thing about KFC is how do you start, you have to bring the chicken in on one side of the fence, and at the other side, you got to have it cooked. And no way can the, the line cross, because then you get cross-contamination. And so there's an yeah. entire exercise that went into trying to figure out how to get the, the chicken off the truck and get it to the, to the clients without it crossing path. Uh, but so being that innovative and trying to figure out solutions is how we figure things out. So in the medical industry, there is a bunch of things that you need to do. Once you do two or three facilities, you understand it. Um, you have to obviously read, understand building codes um, and everything else. Um, and, and one of the things that, that, that we built over the years is a very clear understanding of building codes and zoning codes. And what mm -hmm. we found was that the more understanding of those codes, the better it was to try to develop a good solution for our client, uh, both whether it's an amassing of a building or simply an operation. So the health industry is based on a massive amount of rules. Um, so we learned that very quickly. Um, we took a good chunk of our staff and we understand it. Um, and even today, when we get some projects that are built on different kind of agencies, uh, first thing we do is we, we go read. Uh, you know, so we understand the rules. Building is easy, um, and, and the rules will tell you, you know, you got to be able to put this kind of negative air, this kind of positive air, you got to provide this kind of room, you got to provide that kind of room, you know, all these sort of rules. Once you understand those rules, the architect kicks in, we tell them the rules, and, you know, voila, you have an organ, you have a, a space that meets all of the requirements based on uh, the regulations that then license 
the medical facility. Uh, and they do get very complex, I will tell you. Trying to put in uh, MRI a piece of equipment on a facility is a whole other thing that occurs. You walk in, there's this beautiful room with this giant machine, but what, what happens behind the scene relative to all the stuff that gets put in is all based on, obviously, understanding the rules, the regulations, and, and everything else that sort of comes with it. Fascinating. That's so interesting. Um, last time we were speaking, you, you were mentioning about some of the kind of additional services or the other ways that you advise or help and support clients. And you were talking about um, developer clients and, and actually helping them find tenants. Has that, has, yeah. is this, how, how did so, this, so, this come so, about? So, so there are two parts to that. Um, uh, one of them is, is because of our strength knowledge of, of both the building codes and, and the zone codes um, and being creative, sort of in an architect side of you, uh, and having the exposure to that third-party tenants. So um, when we're asked to do a, uh, a zoning analysis, and, and most of the times what we do is so we, just, we, we put together the rules and how the rules apply to this one building. And, and so mm -hmm. you know, it limits the height, the width, the size of the building. And then we take the building and we create it like a finished product. And we do this at the very beginning. So what, what that basically means is, is we look at the neighborhood, right? Um, now, uh, if you were on Park Avenue and 78th Street, the last thing you want to do is put a retail store in the bottom, although a lot of people would prefer to do that, but that would never happen, right? Yeah. Uh, so what we do is we evaluate the site, not only from, from a zoning aspect of it, but from a neighborhood aspect of it. Um, and then we, we help determine that the, the ground floor has value in, in the various different places. So, so we go through to, to the aspect of maximizing its value based on what zoning permits us to do. And I use maximize value. What most firms will do is explain to you what restrictions you have um, and then ask you, what do you want us to do? We sort of said, this is the restriction and this is the solution. Okay. And in that process, that solution, we may say, oh, you know what? Um, this, this is a great second floor for a gym, right? Um, and we'll say, look, we did a gym for the, this place, we did a gym for that place, this is ideal for it, okay? Or, um, you know, it could be one of the fast food stores that we do um, or any of the other kind of clientele that we produce. So when we present the initial thought to the client, we're almost giving them um, a solution that they would eventually have gotten to once they understood the rules, but because of also our, our big retail uh, clientele, we think that we can potentially put in you know, a supermarket or uh, today it's kind of very limited because it's based on food. Uh, we can't recommend shoe stores. We can't recommend, you know, uh, but, you know urgent cares actually is, is, is probably one of, one of the things. That, and we've done a number of urgent cares uh, across the board. And again, those are the things. Now, I, I tell you the interesting about urgent cares. What people don't realize is that uh, the hospitals have been regulated to reduce 50% of their emergency intake. And they're, 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 they are governed by rules or whatever the, the hospital applies by to reduce 50% of it. And the only way they could do that is by creating these urgent cares. So the urgent cares came out of the rule that the hospital had to reduce its, 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 its uh, output. I mean, they're in right. to the emergency room. Uh, and that's a classic example. So we, we've gone after a number and we've built a number of urgent cares. Uh, and, and, and that's still a trend. Right now, urgent cares are still a necessity, and, and you're seeing much, much more of them coming along. Um, There's an interesting side about the, the nature of the way those, those get built. Uh, but that's a good example. So, so um, and it, this goes back to the, my point about being mergers and acquisition, um, you know, because of trying to merge. Now, I've, I've helped two developers meet each other, and the project has come out of it. I've, I've, I've helped someone with financial happiness, they have a lot of money, and I've introduced them to developers, so then sort of get married together. I've introduced GCs to owners, uh, and all of it with the intention of trying to keep, um, you know, uh, the firm busy. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's almost like it's a, it's a constant job um, across the board, because you basically walk through the street, be obvious. Uh, you know, my wife, uh, I drive her crazy because I walk into a site and I'm looking at everything. Um, on it from, you know, the kind of color the walls are, the type of texture they're putting down, you know, all that stuff helps you create trends and see where, where things are. Um, so not only do I look at uses, I look at, you know, where what materials the world is using and how we should be using them more efficiently. How, um, moving to looking at the, the 
the business itself and the kind of operational structure within the, within your company. How is it set up internally? How many partners do you have? What's the hierarchy look like? So, um, so there there are two partners. So the total of three partners in the firm. Um, yep. There are three other individuals who are been uh, slated to become partners. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a number of requirements that you need to meet to be, get to that point. Um, so being, I'm going to say, you know, 27, 28, 29 years old when I started the firm, the one thing that became super clear to me was that I was the idiot. Uh, and obviously clearly acknowledging that I had no experience in what I was doing. And so one of the things that I did, uh, I don't know if by default, I hired smart people. And so I surrounded myself around smart people. Um, and so I remember being in the room and thinking, oh, my God, I'm the idiot in the room. Um, so I took lots of notes, and I very consciously become aware of all the stuff is. And I will tell you, here we are, you know, 30-some-odd years, and I still think I'm the idiot in the room. Uh, and and, uh, and it, there's, there is a humbleness to that uh, because yeah. you're much more open to, to ideas. Um, and, and, and that has played a huge role in the way we've developed the firm. Um, we have a, a philosophy that, that says that we don't hire smart people. Now, we define smart people as those who have become so smart that there's no room for growth. Mm. They're there. They're really geniuses. They, don't, they have no room for growth. Uh, so we don't hire those people. Uh, uh, this entire staff that we are uh, on understands that personal growth is the single biggest reason that you stay here. Uh, anyone yeah. who shows a lack of that does not survive here uh, very quickly. Um, and so we live in an environment where we all share our experiences, um, good, bad, otherwise. Um, and so, so what it does, it eliminates, I'm going to say, a corporate, uh, and we refer to it as a back scratchers. Uh, we don't have any. Um, and we're very meticulous about the individuals that, that do come onto the firm. Um, and then we also have a, a huge, huge quality of life philosophy. So mm-hmm. what's quality of life? Quality of life means that no one in our office is ever, ever beyond 6.30 in the evening. Okay? Um, in 20, 35 years, we work one Saturday. Okay? Um, and the only reason I remember it because we had this one project and it was completely anomaly. We have a massive loyalty on our staff because of the quality of life. Now, um, the important about quality of life, and we, we, had a, we have this Wednesday morning meeting for 30 minutes every week. And we talk about the, the office and everyone gets to kind of pitch in. And I kind of share this week with them something that they didn't realize. We, we had an issue with a coffee machine. It became a huge thing because the coffee machine broke. We bought the substitute. Anyway, we have this very fancy coffee machine that broke down that we had to send it for repairs. They brought it back and, and obviously life is back to normal. So I says, look, we have a coffee machine. It makes an unbelievable cup of coffee. too. It's a $3,500 coffee machine. So anyway, but so this coffee makes incredible coffee. Uh, the staff sits on a $2,000 chair. And from as long as I can remember, everyone's got multiple monitors. Okay. And so that's all part of quality of life. Um, meaning I sit in you comfortable. You have a nice cup of coffee and, and you have an environment which is these monitors that allow you to be um, more productive relative to the is- easiness of having information surround you so that you can mm. do your job, right? So, and, and then, um, uh, you know, we encourage private lives. Obviously, when it came, you know, it's not a requirement. We encourage, and the only way we encourage is go home early enough and go have a family life. Um, and so what we found early in, at the beginning of our career was when we started to take the level of what the industry does by abusing the staff, they would yeah. abuse them in the evening, except you lose them the first four hours the following day. So any time that you gave me after 6.30, I pay for the next day. And so, so no matter how much I try to push that, because it, it's, it's a reality. You got, you know, eight, 10 hour, eight, nine hour window. Anything you push above that, you're, you're sort of interrupting. And so the philosophy in the firm is that you don't put beyond 45 hours a week. Okay, um, and so most of our staff likes to come in earlier, mm-hmm. then they leave on time in the evening. So, so some come in an hour and a half, um, an hour early. Actually, one of the partners comes in an hour and a half, but then they leave on time in the evening. Okay, um, and there's an enormous value to that. 
specifically in our industry that, that runs across. Um, and then staff is significantly better. And then and because our staff uh, is very much a believer in sharing information, um, there is no stupid questions. Uh, and I have to tell you, it's, 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 it's something that I truly believe in, um, and, and it's something that I, I, I practice. And by that is I will ask somebody, how do you spell the? Um, and the fact that I've asked the question is encouraging. The fact that I asked such a stupid question is even more encouraging. Um, and so that it takes away what we refer to any hierarchy kind of philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, and everyone sort of shares the environment. Um, so we re I refer to it, although they tell me I shouldn't do it because it's changed a little bit. So we sort of have very much a Google environment um, yeah. that, that, that sort of this uh, community base. Um, we celebrate every single birthday, uh, um, and, and there's something going in the office at least once a week uh, over some gathering, and we all sit in a conference room and you know, we cut cake. Uh, we have a number of potluck uh, at least once a month. So there's a lot of different things that, that, that we do as a firm. Um, and so we're very much pushing a community-based organization, uh, but within ourselves. Um, and, and we keep that very low tone um, bickering. There is no bickering in our firm. And if there is, it's very quickly addressed. Uh, and we're big on communication. Um, so as the end result, people want to come to work in the morning here. Mm. Uh, in our world, we've only maintained... At its highest, we've had about 30% remote, uh, right. even during the epidemic. Um, wow. Yeah. So, so, it's, it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a different environment. Look, to me, it's not different. It's norm uh, because it's the nature of the way we kind of put it together. How do you attract talent in the first place? Ooh, how do you, how, how... Uh, so, so just for a moment, coming in from a different environment that I just described. Yeah. Um, and we find that some talent that comes in has a hard time adapting to that. Um, right. And, and, and it's interesting because when there's no hierarchy, the minute you try to be hierarchy, everyone equally kills you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and so, so it's hot. And, and so finding someone, um, so I, I, I call it, we tend to find individuals who come from an abusive environment to be some of our best staff. Um, and, 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 and it's amazing how much you can find relative to that. But finding good talent is difficult. And I don't think that, that there's, I don't think we have any different secret. The one mm -hmm. thing we do have is once they come here, people like it so much and realize how different it is. And that tends to keep them here longer. Um, and, and, then I, and I think that we reasonably pay staff. Um, do I pay a huge top, top dollar? Um, there are some that are there, but I wouldn't say that majority of, of the firms. They get paid a good, fair salary. It's probably the best way of saying. It. However, the more valuable you become, also the salary is compensated equally. Um, so yeah. some of the people that've been with us for a number of years get paid very well. Amazing. You know, time, time gives you that in a, in a bigger, better way. Um, um, and and, and I, I'd like to believe that we're also very generous about you know issues that you have uh, relative to personal life. Um, so. What do you have planned for the rest of the year and looking forward to next year? Well, the, so we, we had a program that just um, finished in New York, uh, something called 421A. So 421A is a tax abatement system. And the way it works in the simplest way is that every single property in New York City is reassessed every year. And people don't realize every single piece of real estate. And so the 421A says if you have an empty lot... And, and we've given you a tax of a hundred thousand dollars, let's say ten thousand dollars for this lot. Um, and now you put a fifty million dollar building on it. We're going to believe that for the next thirty years you have an empty lot, and will not reassess you for the fifty million dollar building that now sits on. Um, after thirty years, for the following ten, they go up like ten percent every year. So at the end of uh, forty years, you wind up with full assessment of a building that's really worth at that point probably worth seventy, eighty million dollars. Um, right. So, so for most developers, uh, not being increased on their base tax over a thirty-year period literally pays for the building, or helps enormously in in in, in uh, being uh, being able to afford to put up the building and maintain it based on current rents. Mm -hmm. So, this is something you're helping developers, yeah, accomplish oh, we, and achieve. Yeah. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Your question, your question is what I see in front of us. So, this program finished. Um, yep. And so 
um, all of the years of what I've been doing is in work right now. Uh, looking for the trend, looking for the different developers, being obvious of what's hitting out there. And I started this conversation with the office space, and that's something that we're aggressively trying to define, sort of pace mm-hmm. ourselves. Um, and, and I think that 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 is that is Google and, and uh, Amazon start to execute what I think is going to happen over the next six months, that the entire population that fits behind that is going to try to figure out how to catch up to that trend of it. So we're hoping that there's some value to that and, and some work. Um, and, then, and then simply look for other sort of trends. Um, and so the, the trends help maintain the firm. Um, the reputation of the firm is what gets us the real work, the work that's uh, uh, much more significant as architects. Um, and, and, and we do keep that very balanced scenario. We refer to as AD work, which is architectural design, or AR, which is architectural record. Architectural record, uh, it's basically the, the meat and potatoes of what the industry uh, or the firm sort of keeps. The design stuff is what really builds the brand. Um, so so it, there is that balance. Um, and I think that... Um, um, midterm elections um, may have some role into what's going to occur at least over the next three months. Yeah. Uh, the next six months is, is really a, a big question in, in my mind. Uh, the bigger question is what is 23 going to look like? Um, so, you know, 23 will represent what we refer to as the last year of the COVID issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and I think that that, uh, that fourth year represents going back to true normal. Um, and But we don't know what that's going to look like relative to, you know, the development of the industry. But one thing that I will tell you is that um, there's an enormous amount of money in the banks for the developers that we work for. Um, and, and they don't make money keeping the money in the bank. Um, yeah. And so, so there are the things that are trending or things that they hit. Uh, and keep in mind that development is all based on rent, uh, income. Right? Income that comes out yeah. of what they do is kind of, um, and and so watching the trends uh, that eventually feed those rents that eventually feed our work is, is something that, that is a constant factor in the way we look at the industry. Um, right there. And obviously governmental work, which is which is the other side of uh, trying to do this. Although governmental work is truly restricted to a number of individuals, not intentional. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah. all just it's because it's built more on bureaucracy than it is based on relationships. Um, but... Wonderful. Wow. Water, thank you so much. I mean, that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. That was yes. in, in, incredibly insightful um, and, and absolutely fascinating to hear. Oh, we spent, know, the, we your... spent an hour here, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I could talk that much. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank, thank you so much. Well, Loved it. Well. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.